nature is healing. Processors are coming back in stock, and the ProArt B5500 Creator has probably caught your eye. Or if not, and you're just looking for some specific motherboards, I'll tell you why the B550 ProArt Creator should catch your eye. Let's take a, a deep walk along memory lane, but also look at some gotchas on one of the incredibly rare motherboards that's actually equipped with Thunderbolt for the AM4 socket. Yes, Thunderbolt 4, and it's pretty mature support as well, but there are, there are some things we need to talk about. Let's dive in. The box bundle gives you the ProArt B550 Creator Guide user installation. You're gonna to wanna to take a look at that. Got uh, some really awesome uh, Asus Control Center Express introduction to download and, and, a, and a key code for activating it or something. It's a unique barcode. The installation CD, which, does anybody even have CD-ROMs on their computers anymore? And we have an, the world's shortest DisplayPort cable. This is actually part of the Thunderbolt solution because you feed the display port out from your graphics card back into the motherboard so that the motherboard can then feed that display output out to a Thunderbolt display. You can do that. We have two SATA 6 cables bundled in the motherboard and some rubber feet used for single-sided M.2 SSDs. Stick this pad onto the existing M.2 pad. So there's two little pads here if you've got an M.2 that's single-sided for better heat dissipation. All right, so first up, this motherboard is compatible with Ryzen 5000 series desktop CPUs and 4000G series APUs. Although I tested a pre-release Ryzen 5000 series APU, it's fine. The chipset here is based around the B550. It's not nearly as much PCI Express connectivity as X570, but there's no fan. So your system will be quieter if you're really worried about a tiny little chipset fan making a lot of noise. It has four DDR4 DIMM slots clocked up to 4866, although for all practical purposes, you're probably gonna be running 3600 with some pretty good timings on this board, so wouldn't worry too much about that. The Ryzen 4000 and 5000 G series CPUs will do a little bit better on the memory clock. The manual does talk about ECC support, and we'll take a close look at that under Linux. Let's take a look at the rear I.O. We've got two Thunderbolt 4, yes, that's right, Thunderbolt 4, USB Type-C ports, four USB 3.2 Gen 2, that's 10 gigabit Type-A ports, two USB 2.0 ports, those are also Type-A, one Display Port, which is input only, one HDMI port, which is output, uh, two Intel 225V 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. Yes, this is the third revision of the silicon. These are the ones that actually work pretty well. So, good job, Intel. We have five audio jacks and an optical SPDIF output port one BIOS flashback button, and one combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port. A mouse and keyboard port for PS2? This is the incredibly rare AT model. See the numlock lights and blue keycaps? This was originally bundled with an IBM AT that also connected to, I think, an AS400 terminal system. Yes, this connects with PS2, and it still works on modern computers. 35 years later. Is it 35 years? Almost 35 years. Yeah, almost, almost 35 years. And it still works. That's why they put that port on there. People that are buying this motherboard, they have that keyboard or keyboards like that. Is he standing on an anti-static workstation mat? Yeah. All right, as always, Asus is pretty smart with their board layout. You got a right angle connector here for your front panel, you know, USB five gigabit port. Your USB-C connection is up here. It's plenty out of the way for a graphics card or whatever else. We've got two M.2 ports, one directly into the CPU, one through the chipset. This is a PCI Express 4.0 interface on this M.2, and this is rare, 110 millimeter M.2 support. Things like your Optane M.2, uh, like the 375 gig variant, those are 110 millimeters. It drives me insane because some of the higher end boards from Asus, like the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme Threadripper board, those are all 80 millimeter. You gotta go with an add-in card to get 110 millimeter. <sighs> In terms of VRM cooling, uh, it's a little more aesthetic than functional. It's just a big old block of aluminum. There's not a heat pipe that I can see or an interface or anything like that. It's just designed to dissipate heat. And really, it's just for looks and show because, you know, at the top end, this little plucky CPU is gonna melt a socket if it's gonna go past 150 watts. And these VRM are not so inefficient that they're gonna burn a hole in the board 
150 watts with much more modest cooling than what we see here. One thing that is kind of cool is that the heatsink does extend sort of under the IO shroud here. So depending on what you've got for your rear exhaust, probably you're gonna get some airflow. If you're using a tower cooler, you'll get some pretty good airflow. Over this part of the board, it will be fine. For power input, we have a combination eight pin and four pin. The eight pin can deliver up to 400 watts. So I don't see the point of connecting the four pin, although you can if you want to. It doesn't have a diagnostic LED readout or anything like that to give you a postcode, but it does have helpful LEDs in the corner that will give you an idea of what is maybe uh, going on during the boot sequence. It's labeled boot, VGA, DRAM, and CPU. So if you're having CPU problems or you're missing your microcode, your CPU light comes on, you can use the BIOS flashback to actually flash it, which is pretty awesome. In terms of other features for this board, it's actually pretty modest. If we look at the PCIe layout, because that's what I'm always curious about, especially on a creator board, because on a creator board, you're thinking, is this gonna be video capture cards, a lot of PCIe add-ins, that kind of thing. We have two reinforced slots. It's by 16 or by eight by eight to the CPU. That's a pretty standard configuration. So if you run anything in this slot, even a by four capture card or by one capture card, it's going to drop this slot down to by eight. So depending on what your GPU is, that probably doesn't matter in this day and age but uh, it is something to be aware of, especially if you have a PCI Express 4 GPU. Running a PCI Express 4 GPU at by eight right now today doesn't really matter. You could run dual GPUs with this for rendering or something like that. I don't really recommend that. I don't, I don't know that I would really recommend using the X8 slot for any add-in peripheral except uh, something that was really high speed, like really, really high speed, higher speed than a capture card. It pretty much relegates it to just a video card or some other specialty add-in device. And we have two PCI Express by one slots and one PCI Express by four slot. Now these other slots go through the chipset, but what you might not realize is this PCI Express four slot shares bandwidth with the Thunderbolt controller. The Thunderbolt controller is 40 gigabit. That's gonna eat a significant amount of our upstream bandwidth from the chipset to the CPU. That, that link is not an insane amount of bandwidth, so you gotta watch that. We still do have you know, plenty of overhead. It's not gonna, it's not gonna saturate that connection, um, but it is something to keep in mind if you're running a lot of other stuff. So those, those share bandwidth. The PCI Express by one slot shares bandwidth with the M.2. So if you're running a PCI Express by one peripheral, you have to pay attention to which slot it goes in if you're running dual M.2 because it can affect your other M.2. So my recommendation for this board, if you're going for like a high performance system, carefully choose your peripherals. Uh, if you're gonna go for um, something that's doing video capture, you might wanna go for USB video capture as opposed to PCI Express video capture. PCI Express video capture is much, much, much more reliable um, over USB, but you would probably go with something even higher end if you're really, really worried about that. And you do always have the ace of the other PCI Express by eight slot. ASUS has their workstation boards, which have like a, it's like a by eight, by four, by four configuration. And I think this makes more sense uh, for somebody in like the creator role that actually has a lot of peripherals. So maybe look at that and consider that if you're worried about it. But if you're just gonna build a single GPU workstation with one or two fast NVMe, none of this matters for you. And this is the perfect board for that. If you're running like a 5800X or 5900X, and you need a reasonable motherboard to pair with that, this would be a good choice. Even if you're gonna go for a 5950X, but you don't anticipate really needing more than dual GPUs or a single GPU and a couple of high performance add-in cards, then this would also be a pretty good choice. It does also have four onboard SATA ports, which would be good for mechanical hard drives and, and that sort of thing. So uh, you could combine that with mechanical storage or even cheap you know, SATA SSD, so you can get a four terabyte SATA SSD, you know, Chia notwithstanding, uh, for about a hundred dollars a terabyte, which is a pretty good deal. I've got three four pin fan headers up here. Two of those are for the CPU push pull configuration, water pump and, and you know, CPU fans, whatever you want to go for that. Another header for, you know, your case fans. There's another four pin fan header around here for the front. So you can sort of use a combination of those for your, your fans. It works out pretty well. 
We've got an RGB addressable header here, an RGB 5050 header up here. So you can keep these connections hidden and out of the way because this is usually a rubber grommet area. And there's usually lots of, of room to hide your cables at the top of your case above the top of the motherboard. So that's pretty nice. And the power is over here out of the way and sort of hidden from the front by the uh, the large heat sinks. This design is kind of reminiscent of NZXT if I'm completely honest. The rest of the way along the front edge of the motherboard, we have our 24 pin ATX power connector, USB type C uh, connection, our you know five gigabit USB connection. Uh, the front panel connector is at the front bottom edge of the motherboard, so you can route that. There is a separate clear real-time clock, clear CMOS header located here. That's pretty awesome. We have two USB 2.0 headers for additional peripherals that you might add in. Uh, some water pumps and other things like that can be controlled through a USB 2.0 interface, even the stock, you know, remember the, the third gen Ryzen, you know, the Wraith heat sinks, those had a USB interface. You can plug it in there and work out fine. Got an external temperature sensor. The box doesn't come with a temperature sensor, but if you get an analog temperature sensor, you can hook that up there. Four pin fan header, another 5050 and digital RGB header, another four pin fan header, an RS-232 header, and your front panel audio header. Now this front panel audio solution is Asus Special Sauce. It's Realtek a ALC 1220A, 120 dB signal to noise ratio, but it's only about 113 dB for the recording input. It is a pretty good solution for an onboard audio solution. If you want something high end, you're probably going to want to get an add-in card, and that's going to chew up one of your X1 slots. Now, as I always say, to get to know a board, you've got to do a build. So we're going to do a build with this board. I've selected the Ryzen 5900X for this particular build. Well, let's get started. If we're going to do a build, we need the entire rest of the system, right? I mean, <laughs> you could set the processor and the motherboard on the box, but I wouldn't recommend it. So this is the rest of our system. We've got a modest power supply, an NZXT case, and a Corsair closed loop cooling system. Now, it's fine. It's a 280 millimeter loop, and if I had my preferences, I would put the tubes down, because that's what you do, you put the tubes down. That's how it goes. But I'm also planning on maybe putting a big graphics card in here and having tubes and graphics card. I don't know if that's gonna work out for me. Now for this build, for the memory, I've decided to go with Mushkin Redline. Remember Mushkin from way back in the day? I had a Redline kit. Okay, it was maybe a little bit nostalgia and also maybe a little bit price point. Mushkin is back with a vengeance and they're at a really competitive price point. This particular kit is two 16 gig sticks of memory. So this is a 1.4 volt kit. They're pushing the voltage a little bit. They've got a pretty good heat spreader. It's relatively low profile memory, so it'll work with coolers like the uh, Thermosiphon Ice Giant and other, other coolers like the Arctic TR50 that won't tolerate really tall memory. The timings on it are also pretty good. It's DDR4 3600, but the timings are 16, 19, 19, 39. It's not the best, but it's not the worst. And it's pretty darn good given the price point. I have a Mew on this motherboard is, is, is looking decent, except for everything that's off the chipset is in group 15. So that's not really an ideal situation. And this is also one of the boards that with the, you know, the latest BIOS update on cards like Navi 10, you get an upstream and a downstream PCI Express port, which are actually in different Iowa MMU groups. So it's a little, it's a little odd. Uh, and then of course, group 18 is the actual 3D controller. Uh, everything else is is not bad. The audio device is in, is in its own uh, group as well as one of the USB controllers, which is maybe handy if you're going to run, you know, something like an APU build. Although that'll vary uh, just a little bit with, um, you know, depending on what CPU that you have. Uh, of course, the the NVMe slot is in its own group as you'd expect, so that's pretty awesome. And then everything else sort of just <laughs> falls into group 15. So. Uh, less awesome, but hey, what are you going to do? Otherwise, Linux compatibility is really good. Those two Intel NICs work great because, you know, they're Intel NICs. I mean, they're in the same IMMU group, but, you know, otherwise they're, they're completely fine. And Thunderbolt support. Hey, we've got first class Thunderbolt support right here on, on Linux. It is an Alpine Ridge 4C 2015 controller. So this is like one of the latest revisions of Alpine Ridge. So it should be pretty trouble free. Well, and there we are. That's our more or less complete Ryzen 9 build. Now, temporarily, I've got Navi 10 5700 XT in here. I'm probably gonna swap this GPU out ultimately, but this was useful for testing and it was useful for testing Linux. I don't know, there's just something about the Asus ProArt aesthetic that I think sort of goes with the NZXT aesthetic. You know, I mean, besides the similar heat sinks.
and the aesthetics are probably one of the things that you'll find most appealing about this build. The Mushkin Redline memory performed as expected. It's a pretty nice zippy little machine. Ended up putting a Corsair MP600 in there. It's a PCI Express Gen 4 SSD. It's not the latest and greatest as far as PCIe Gen 4, but hey, in this climate, you know, you sort of, you sort of gotta take what you can find, take what you can find on sale. Uh, it worked out pretty good overall in this build. Like I say, if I was doing it over, if I was doing a fresh build, I'd probably use a tower cooler instead of an AIO. But the airflow through this case and the layout and all that kind of stuff, it's pretty good for a build like this. I think that if I were going to build a higher end version of this, I would definitely look for an X570. Rumor has it that Asus is working on an X570 version of the Creator, and they're opting to try to use a newer revision of the X570 chipset that doesn't require a active cooling, it doesn't require a fan. So if that's why you were looking at this, just be aware that there's that, and it's gonna have way more PCI Express connectivity for multiple M.2s and multiple add-in peripherals and that kind of thing. With this setup, with a single M.2, I don't think it's gonna be too problematic. And overall, I'm pretty happy with how this build turned out. The temperatures are, are pretty good with the, the 280 millimeter AIO, as you'd expect. I mean, it's only, it's two six core chiplets. There's not gonna be a lot of hot spots. Having uh, 32 gigabytes of memory total, is a pretty good sweet spot for this platform, especially when we're talking about 12 cores. All in all, it's a pretty balanced system. The Thunderbolt worked perfectly on Linux as well as Windows. Truthfully, I would like to see more Thunderbolt knobs and tunables in the BIOS in the UEFI, because there are edge cases, especially with older Thunderbolt peripherals where it can still be problematic. Even installing the ASUS drivers from the ASUS website immediately pops up from Intel and Intel says, oh, this isn't a supported platform. But ASUS has apparently done something to the installer because you get a couple flashes of black screens and then the installer continues and then the control utility still works fine even though the Intel installer says that it's not a supported platform. So I don't think it's really that it's not a supported platform since it's certified Thunderbolt at this point, but it is one of those weird things. And if you've got some older Thunderbolt peripherals, it may be a little problematic because in my experience, the DCH drivers, the ones that come from the Windows Store, in other words, are a little bit less polished than the ones that you can otherwise get online. And there's a component to the drivers that is in the thing you downloaded from Asus, but then the GUI for managing it comes from the Windows Store. It's a very weird situation that Microsoft is forcing on all of us with with, with how that works. Or we could just run it in Linux where it's basically plug and play, a little easier to deal with. I'm Wendell, this has been a level one build. If you have any questions, comments, critiques, or wanna ask questions or do some variability with uh, something that you were looking at, come to the level one forums, ask questions, hang out, let me know. I'll be there, I'm there all the time. It's like the Hotel California for me. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.